Okay, so I think we're going to get started because we have a relatively short period of time, so uh, people can join us as we go along. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ann Bowker. I'm the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Enrollment in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and we're really happy to have you guys here tonight to hear us talk and, and do a little bit of a deep dive into social sciences in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And tonight we're um, really pleased to have uh, representatives from a number of different social science departments. We have Matt Sorley, um, who is an instructor in the Department of Psychology. He teaches intro psych as well as um, some of our, our first year seminars, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, we have uh, William Flynn, who is an instructor in sociology. He also teaches intro um, an intro course to sociology as well as a first year seminar. Uh, we have Danielle Dinabelli Lang, who is from anthropology. Um, she doesn't teach first year courses. I think it's more the, the, the final year, the honors projects, those kinds of things that Danielle's involved with. She's the undergrad supervisor in the Department of Anthropology. And then last but not least, we have Mark McLeod, who is um, from Cognitive Science. Uh, he is an instructor in Cognitive Science who teaches intro level courses, and he's also the, um, the undergrad supervisor. So um, the plan for tonight is really just to chat a little bit in more detail about these different social science programs. Some of you are probably familiar with psychology, anthro, and sociology because of that high school course that you get to take um, where they're all kind of smushed together. So we're going to deconstruct them a little bit and give you uh, um, some ideas about how they, they might differ. Um, we'll have um, a chat going forward. I'll be talking to each um, of these four representatives and then you'll have a chance to ask questions at the end. Uh, or if something comes out before that, just, just feel free to put your question in the chat and, uh, and we'll get to it for sure. So um, we're going to start with sociology and anthropology. They're in the same department at Carleton, but they are not the same thing. So William, maybe you can lead off just telling us a little bit about sociology and what it's all about. Oh, thanks, Anne. Uh, hi, everyone. I want to welcome you all uh, to the chat. Um, and basically, in terms of uh, what exactly is sociology and what it's about and how it might be, how it is different from anthropology, uh, sociology is, is broadly the, the study of human society. And that means that we also study things like technology and animals, uh, as well as humans as well. Uh, and it largely revolves around questions of inequality. So a lot of sociologists in our department um, study issues of inequality, things like racism, uh, things like uh, poverty, things like sexism, etc. Um, so a lot of our studies revolve around social issues. The things that we end up studying, um, things like social institutions, social processes, uh, group dynamics, um, social data, statistics, there's a whole range of methods, uh, and it's one of the highlights of sociology, one of its strong points, is that we have a, a wide range of different methods for investigating the social world. So if you're interested in statistics, if you're interested in uh, writing essays, if you're interested in feminist methods, uh, if you're interested in multimedia methods, uh, then sociology has a very broad range uh, of tools for investigating the social world. Um, in terms of sociology and anthropology, then those disciplines, even though we're in, we're separate, separate and in joint at the same time, uh, they're very complementary. Um, I won't speak for anthropology, but I think that as a joint department, we have a lot of cross-listed courses. Uh, we have a lot of interdisciplinary studies between myself and my colleagues like Danielle and other people around FAS and, and the university. Um, so I think that combined, they're, they're extremely complementary and really feed well off each other uh, too, you know. Uh, so that would be kind of a, a five minute sketch, if, if that's okay, kind of a rough and ready sketch of what sociology is. I left out a whole load, but um, that's a kind of a, kind of a, a quick, quick sketch of it. Yeah, great, great start. And we will definitely come back. So Danielle, um, what's anthropology all about? Perfect. Thanks. And thanks for the sort of setup, Billy. And I completely agree um, that the sociology and anthropology departments are also together because they're complementary approaches to understanding the human condition in the broadest sense of the term. Um, in many contexts, anthropology is really the study of human existence from the dawn of the species Homo sapiens up until the present with an interest in uh, the material culture humans have left behind, you know, and can include things like primatology, forensic archaeology, um, 
human genetics, all kinds of things like that. Um, but the, by far the largest branch of anthropology um, and is what's called sociocultural anthropology. So that's contemporary human societies um, worldwide, uh, certainly an interest in the histories of those societies as well, but definitely people you can talk to um, or people who have left a record that you can access through language is, is what is mainly studied now. And the, um, and the program at Carleton is exclusively a sociocultural anthropology department. Some of us know a bit about material culture. Um, some of us have been trained in what's called the four fields. And we know a bit about language and the evolution of the human species and can speak to it. But what we study and try to seek to understand is, is the human experience through sharing that experience. So um, whereas uh, in a way, like sociology, we have uh, many different approaches to that study, um, but whereas sociology, as Billy said quite rightly, has a variety of methods uh, to approach human experience, really anthropology has one method, and that method is called ethnography, which is basically understanding other humans through living as closely as possible with them and trying to understand it from their perspective and to try to understand the same social systems that a sociology sociologist would study sort of a bit more in the abstract from outside as they are to live within. Um, and that, that's the technique called ethnography. It's based on conversations with people. The sort of more informal the conversation is, the better it is for an anthropologist. Um, and we consider that what we do with those conversations and exercise in reflexive interpretation. So we say, what does this mean? And then we sort of try it back out with the people, try it back with others and kind of keep talking and dialogue until in the end, we produce an account of human experience that's very close to what that experience is for the people who have lived it, but also can be understandable to people who don't live it. And that's what anthropologists offer the world, sort of understanding from the perspective of the other um, that treats that person sort of an equal footing uh, to the self, and then that we can all sort of understand each other better <laughs> from, from that point of view and from our own. And in the end, um, one of the things that's really good about it for students, even if you don't come on, go on to sort of be a practicing anthropologist, is people do find, um, find way to understand their own experience as being different and, and to really appreciate the difference that we all bring to the table, whatever that ends up being um, in the world. Super, thanks very much. Matt, how does psychology fit in there? Well, I, first of all, thanks everyone for, for taking time out of your day to, to join us, much appreciated. I, one of the courses that I teach is Introduction to Psychology and, and our students very quickly realize that psychology is huge. It is a very large discipline, but no matter what we're talking about, no matter what we're researching, uh, the focus is very much on our thoughts and feelings and behaviors and at Carleton, we focus on a number of different areas. One of them is, is human development and it's really how our, how our psychology changes across the lifespan. So I likely don't have to tell you that the, the thoughts of a five-year-old are different from that of a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old or a 45-year-old or an 85-year-old. Uh, we also talk about uh, cognition and really about how we, we use information and, and, and how we, we learn. We talk about social psychology and, and, and our relationships and how we come to influence uh, each other and how others come to influence us and a variety of different types of relationships. We talk about forensic psychology and how we can use information about our thoughts and feelings and behaviors and use the science to try to better understand the, the criminal justice system. We also focus on, on health psychology and trying to understand how we, we cope with stress and how we deal with adversity and what can we do to, to try to beef up our, our resilience so that we can handle situations much like the situation that we're all experiencing now with the, with the pandemic. We also have another area called organizational psychology, which focuses on, on the workplace and workplace safety and health and, and, and performance and, and really trying to help organizations to, to try to create environments in which people can succeed and, and ultimately can learn and, and thrive. And we've got a, a variety of other elements as well in our department uh, too. But the common thread that runs through all of that is this interest in thoughts and feelings and behaviors. And so one of the things that really all of our students are interested in doing is certainly that they're, they're, they're interested in approaching the topic from, a, from an intellectual curiosity, definitely, 
but many of our students are also really interested in trying to better understand their world and the world around them. And a great many of them with an idea to, to try to improve their, their little corner of the world, if only in a small way. Thanks, Matt. So would you say that one of the differences then between psychology versus sociology and anthropology is, is really more of a focus sort of on the individual, on trying to understand individual thoughts and feelings and how they might predict behavior. You might also look at groups, but really you're starting from a point of wanting to understand the individual as opposed to the society or the group or the culture kind of thing. Yeah, very much focused on, on the individual. Even when we're looking at relationships, we're looking at that from an individual point of view and how those influences are affecting their thoughts and feelings and behaviors, yes. Okay, super, thanks. So now cognitive science is maybe uh, an area that you're less familiar with because there is no high school course on cognitive science. So we're really happy to have Mark here um, to explain to us what cognitive science is all about. Thanks, Anne, and thanks very much for uh, having me on the panel today. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of connections between cognitive science and each of the topics that we've already been talking about today. But I think the best way to think about cognitive science is to first and foremost see it as an interdisciplinary approach to understanding the human mind. So we're, we're uh, very excited in CogSci to be trying to figure out how thinking works. We start with humans, but we also think about animal thought and uh, artificial thought as well. And the other line the sort of motivation is this is a really tough problem. The human brain is one of the most complex things uh, that we that we know of in the universe. And, that, and any attempt to understand how it works is going to involve looking at it from a lot of different perspectives. So that's where the interdisciplinary part comes in to CogSci. Um, so, so part of psychology, cog, cognitive psychology, which focuses on information processing, is, is one of the uh, parts of cognitive science. But we also have people in our in our department who are who are linguists who study language and how children learn language how people learn a second language how language is processed in the brain uh, we have neuroscientists who are looking at how the brain works and how different uh, parts of the brain contribute to cognitive processing uh, we have philosophers like myself who, who ask questions about consciousness and representation and how how those sorts of things work and we also have people in computer science who are interested in uh, programming and, and designing artificial machines that can simulate and perhaps actually think as well. And so students in our program get to, uh, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but students in our program get to, to look at all those issues. And, and the, the neat thing that we have in our program is that we have a lot of uh, interdisciplinary connections and students get to learn about the, the different methods that all those approaches use, but they also get to pick one of those five areas to focus on and to concentrate in and get uh, extra courses in that area. And so that's, that's the basic uh, beginning point. And, and what we hope to do over the four years is to get all our students to, to, to develop an understanding of how uh, the mind ultimately works. Cool, thanks, Mark. So I'd like to maybe move to talking a little bit about how the program is structured. And I'm gonna go back to Matt and, and start with Matt and Mark, because I think those two programs are a little bit more structured, very hierarchical in terms of what courses you have to take when. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that before um, we move to Sochant and find out um, how it works there. Sure, well in psychology in first year, it's very much focused on introduction to psychology. So you take a couple of courses that introduce you to this impossibly huge discipline. As you move into second year, you start focusing on uh, content specific areas. You might decide to take some cor a course in forensic psychology and developmental psychology and social psychology. You'll also be taking a course in research methods and statistics because certainly the, the, the how uh, of science is just as important as anything else. Uh, by the time you get to third year, you start drilling into an area that really interests you the most. So say, for example, you're into forensic psychology, then you might be taking a course in, uh, in uh, criminal behavior or, or police psychology. You'd also be taking a course in research design and analysis, which is a full year course, which really ups the ante in terms of what you were learning about uh, stats and methods in second year. By the time you're, you're through those first three years, you're ready to complete a capstone project in your fourth year if you're in the honors program. And that involves either uh, writing a thesis, which involves being a member of a, a, a faculty member's lab. And then you're gonna be, you're gonna be uh, developing a research question. You're going to be designing a study. You're going to be uh, gathering data, analyzing that data and writing it all up in a very impressive document known as a thesis. The other option of, in terms of capstone projects in our program is that you have an opportunity to complete what's known as the honors project course. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of like a, a larger seminar kind of class 
but you end up being the class expert in your area of, uh, of interest. So maybe you're interested in developmental psychology and you want your focus to be on positive youth development or something of that nature. Well, then you get to indulge that interest through a variety of different assignments. Along the way, you have a number of options. If you'd like, you can declare a concentration in one of these particular areas. And then you'll be taking a variety of other content courses, particularly in third and fourth year, uh, related to your, your uh, chosen area. Maybe that's health, uh, health psychology and well-being. Uh, maybe that is organizational psychology, whatever it, it happens to be. And then ultimately that would be uh, displayed on your degree. So there is also along the way a number of opportunities to, to really engage in some experiential learning. So you might decide that you're going to complete a practicum in the third or fourth year. So maybe that will involve uh, a volunteering in the community and, and gaining a course credit along the way. So you might be volunteering at the, the Royal Ottawa or with Corrections Canada or with the, the, uh, the, the school board, a variety of other options as well. So there's a fair amount of, of structure, but one of the nice things about that is you get a fair amount of support along the way, not just from, from your faculty, but also from our, our departmental advisors as well. Thanks, Pam. So Mark, how does cognitive science kind of fit with that sort of structured framework that, that Matt has just sort of described? Yeah, so as, as you're uh, indicating, we do have a fair bit of structure in our program, and it starts with the fact that I mentioned those five different areas that make up CogSci. So every student in CogSci starting in year one will pick one of those five areas. So those linguistics, psychology, uh, neuroscience, philosophy, and computer science uh, to concentrate in. So what that means is even though you'll be taking courses in all five areas throughout your, your four years with us, you, you'll be taking extra courses in, in, one, in, in the area that you're concentrating. And in fact, you'll have almost as many courses in that area as someone who's say majoring in psychology or linguistics. Um, but along the way, there will be a few courses you take in each of the other areas. And, and the neat thing about our department is we have CogSci profs who actually teach what are called cognitive science courses. So these are courses each year from first year seminars in the beginning, all the way up to fourth year seminars um, that will, will bring in all these different methods from those five areas. Uh, so as you concentrate on the one area, you'll be picking up a bunch of extra courses there, but you'll also be taking courses along the way that, that, that make up these other areas in cognitive science and show how everything fits together. Um, also, similarly to psychology, we have an honors thesis option in fourth year. We have an honors project option as well, which is more of a class setting to do some experimental work. Um, and that sort of rounds out the year. Um, cognitive science and I think psychology as well participate in a co-op program at Carleton. So that's another opportunity students have where they can actually get job placements in those areas to sort of see how it, how it is to actually uh, do work in the field that you're studying in. And, and it's often very interesting to get a sense of how it's different to, to approach a subject in the classroom versus actually working out in the workplace. And so those opportunities are there as well for us, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, that's great. So Danielle, how does anthropology sort of fit with, uh, in terms of structure and, and the, those kinds of things? Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Anne. I think we're probably the least structured program of the bunch, which we've done on purpose, although it doesn't mean it's completely um, free for all. So of the, I guess it's, 18 half credits or sort of individual classes you have to take as part of your part within the major. Um, five of those credits are predetermined. So we have to take a year long uh, foundations course, typically taken in the second year um, after you've taken an intro, but you can take one of two intros or a first year seminar. Um, and then in the third year, there's a separate course in sort of theory, method, and history of anthropological thought. And so everyone takes that. And in those courses, you do get to sort of bond with people who are in your cohort and make sure that sort of everyone knows some of the same thing. But because anthropology really is about human difference, um, our curriculum reflects that. And so there's like, well, not a million, but quite a wide variety of other type, other topical courses you can take um, you know, that reflect the expertise of the faculty. You know, uh, yeah, so, um, so, and we hope that you, oh, will, you know, explore your interests and take a variety of those. Um, you certainly have the opportunity to concentrate more heavily in a particular area if that interests you. Like we do have sort of, sort of beginning level, intermediate level, and advanced level offerings in the various sort of subfields, even within sociocultural anthropology, that also reflect our 
our expertise. So you can take a kind of class at every year level um, that's about issues related to indigenous people. You can take a class at every year level about things that are going on in Asia, similarly in Africa. So there's sort of a global region, or um, you could take a class at every year level that has to do with thinking about the environment and human relations with nature, which is which is my thing. Um, and there are other sort of topical areas that you can explore. So you're not like stuck with just sort of endless variety, um, but you do definitely have the opportunity to explore your interests and discover new interests, ideally. Um, and then um, in the fourth year, we also have an honors research um, paper option that is meant to give you an opportunity to do your own research, um, your own, ideally your own ethnography um, on a topic that you develop uh, together um, with whoever the advisor is for that class, as well as uh, we do have a class for it. So that you really gather and talk about how it goes um, together through the thing. We really encourage you to do it. It's a great experience for people. And we also have placement and co-op options um, that people generally do in what would be our co-op, sort of what would be the fourth year and then you do an extra year or placement tends to be taken in the winter of the third year we also understand that these years are like don't always work out exactly the way you think um so you can sort of start taking second year classes really after one semester and you can start taking third year classes in your second year so you can kind of move around the and kind of come up with a program of study that mixes sort of more or less challenging courses together, which um, most students find advantageous. Um, and yeah, so that's, so that's how it works in the end. Um, you get some study, you know, knowledge that's in common with everyone else who's in the program with you. And you really also have your own expertise that you've developed over the course of the four years. Yeah, I would say that anthropology is probably the broadest discipline we have in FAS. I, you know, I have, uh, a daughter and her partner who are both um, involved in anthropology and his master's is on driverless car technology um, in anthropology. Um, and she went to France and studied the tool rag people and their use of music and identity. And, you know, they both got an anthropology degree kind of thing. So um, that's pretty cool, I think, in terms of the, the options that are available. Um, they both did well, amazing jobs as well, I should say. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> I'm biased, obviously, but yeah, I think we did. Um, William, tell me about sociology and, and how it, the program is structured. Yeah, we have a, a sort of a fairly well-structured program in sociology. I teach a Introduction to Sociology, first-year courses. So if you were taking my class or any of the other introductory classes, you would be getting a broad outline of some of the main fields in sociology, right? Uh, so things like um, uh, gender, things like indigenous issues, things like the media, uh, things like culture and society, class, addiction, disability, a whole range of different topics, as well as learning and being introduced to the key theoretical and methodological uh, skills of the discipline. So by the time you're finished first year, you basically have a choice then in second year of, you know, whether or not you want to continue uh, and concentrate in one of our social justice streams, which is uh, extremely popular at the moment. Uh, the social justice stream started quite recently, and basically it follows from second year all the way up to fourth year, uh, finishing in the uh, community engaged sociology class where students get to work with community groups under the supervision of teaching assistants and professors. Students have worked uh, with the Herringate uh, Community Project on housing. Uh, they worked in women's shelters for violence against women. There was recently a course designed for trips to Nepal, uh, combining uh, activists in Nepal working on LGBTQ plus issues and Canadian activists as well. Um, so there's that particular stream in sociology. Um, in second year, you can, if you're into methods, you can, and if you're a numbers person, you can decide to concentrate on quantitative methods, right? Uh, in second and third year, or if you're a people person like myself and Danielle and many others here, you can decide to focus more on qualitative methods. So if you like interviewing people, you like learning those kind of skills, uh, those would be uh, two of the method options for you. We have a wide range of courses ranging from sociology of food and culture to the sociology of war to technology, culture and society uh, to a whole range of, you know, obviously socially relevant topics as well. So the thing with our program is that um, if you finish in an honors program, you can do the capstone course or you can do the honors research essay, like similar to what Matt was talking about. And basically these courses are designed to really kind of showcase your skills and what you've learned and you becoming a, an expert in that field, so to speak, right? 
Uh, we also have numerous vocational programs as well as a co-op program uh, and as well as many students in our department actually actively work with faculty helping to design courses. Uh, it's a recent uh, university initiative so they work closely with faculty uh, you know, collaboratively working on design courses, on uh, topic courses, as well as skills and vocational skills as well. We're a very large department. We've over 40 full-time faculty, uh, and there's an immense range and level of expertise in our department as well. So if there's any topic that you can think of uh, that you would like to study from a sociological perspective, then there's definitely room for you in our department uh, to help you facilitate those interests. And basically, just to finish, if you think of all of the COVID-19 pandemic stuff that's been happening, and if you remember reading the headlines and all of the issues like childcare, racism, all of these things, that's all the stuff that sociologists study. Right. Uh, so those kind of social issues, if you're interested in those and others, uh, our department and our program certainly kind of uh, allows you to choose as well as be structured within that program uh, as well. Super. Thank you. Uh, I, I should also point out that um, even if you decided to major in sociology, you could still take courses in psychology, anthropology, um, even cognitive science. So there, there's a possibility of, of taking courses in all these areas, because I must admit, sitting here listening, I think, well, yeah, like that would be kind of cool. I could take that and then I could take that. Um, so I'm conscious that we're kind of getting close to six, but what I wanted to sort of maybe finish off our last kind of round of questions about is what the paths might look like once you have a degree in psychology or sociology or anthropology. Now, clearly with an undergrad degree, you're not gonna be able to set up a shingle and call yourself an anthropologist or a cognitive scientist, but um, I think the courses that you take and the sort of focus of the programs is somewhat different as well. So Matt, maybe we'll start with you. What kinds of careers are students generally thinking about if they're, if they're in a psychology program? I think one of the things that, that's worth men mentioning is that irrespective of what one's major is, it's very much about the skills that you acquire and refine along the way with a, with a degree program. So in psychology, our students end up graduating with a pretty wide range of skills. They tend to be able to, to break problems down by able to look at them from, from uh, physiological angles and emotional angles and cognitive angles and social angles, etc. Uh, they also tend to be very good at being able to, to make decisions based on evidence. They're solid communicators. They're critical thinkers. They are, they're really very well aware of, of, of the standards of, of ethical behavior. Uh, they tend to be able to break down very complex problems. These are the sorts of skills that are, are really very important. And, and also, they're, they're, they tend to be quite skilled in terms of research design and statistical analysis and evaluating research claims, et cetera. And this can be important across a pretty wide range of sectors of the economy and thoughts, feelings, and behaviors tend to come up uh, in a variety of different careers. And so we have students who are in government, uh, in business, uh, they are uh, clinical psychologists, they are counselors, they're in human resources, they're in communications, they're in corrections. It's, it's a very, very wide range. I know that when I, when I uh, ask students at the end of the first class in Introduction to Psychology, as I ask them, I say, why are you here? What is the hook? What is it that attracted you to the discipline? And I would say that the overwhelming majority of people will start off by saying, I wanna help people, right? That's one of the first primary motivations. But as they start being exposed to a wider range of ideas, and research and other courses and, and different perspectives. As they start having conversations with faculty and each other, they start thinking differently and they start thinking about other possibilities. And so maybe it's not just about wanting to become a psychologist or a counselor, but there are all these other possibilities as well. And then as they start gaining experience via a practicum or co-op or, or other jobs and other sorts of scenarios in other parts of their life on and off campus, that also can change the thinking a, a little bit. It's also worth mentioning that irrespective of, of one's discipline, there is a lot of support along the way at Carleton in terms of helping you to figure out where, where you fit. Are, are, do you, are you in the right major? Uh, what's the typical career path in any particular discipline? Uh, what is the job market like? Who can I talk to who's doing something out in the world that I'm interested in? And, and can they be a mentor? 
So lots of, of different explorations that take place along the path. And we certainly, certainly in psychology, we don't expect you to know exactly what you want to do when you arrive on campus or virtual campus on day one. It's expected that this is this is a process. Okay, thanks, man. Uh, and I think you're right with all of these um, disciplines that um, you don't have to have it all sorted out initially, and they're a pretty broad range. But one of the things that's probably most popular in psychology is this idea of wanting to be a counselor or somebody who helps others. That's certainly, I would say, the majority of students maybe start off in psychology in part um, because of that. Mark, what about cognitive science? Yeah, so cognitive science, I mean, I want to start by agreeing with, with a couple of things that Matt said, that I, I think that any of these programs and anything in FAST really is, is one of the things you come out of with is just the ability to, to think critically uh, in the ability to communicate. And I think these are strengths that will help you with any uh, career aspirations you have. Um, one of the nice things about cognitive science in particular, I think is the flexibility our students have coming out of this. So uh, everyone is trained as a cognitive scientist. And so there are more and more jobs now that are looking for people who understand the mind or are interested in human thinking or thought. Um, and so students have that, uh, that uh, asset, but they also have the, um, the, the, uh, the skills that they've learned for, uh, that come along with the particular concentration they picked as well. And that'll sort of partially determine the routes that are available to you as a student graduating from our program. So if you chose say uh, the language, language and linguistics stream, uh, speech pathology is an option. There's lots of um, different career paths that involve language or processing language or understanding how language works. Whereas if you chose a neuro stream, the neuroscience stream, then there'll be a, a, another set of opportunities out there. So there's sort of a common set of skills that all of our students have, uh, which, which involve critical thinking and also designing and, and carrying out uh, empirical research and those sorts of things. And then there's the, the, the subset of other skills that you'll have depending on your area of concentration. Um, I also think it's really a, a good uh, thing to remember that Carleton has a great uh, career services office that can help students, uh, no matter what uh, program they're in, to, to be aware of the sorts of job opportunities that are out there. And, and uh, one of the neat things about that, of course, is there's lots of careers opening up every day where people often be going through university and get a job in a career that they didn't even know existed before they started. And so I think that's part of the excitement of it is finding out these new opportunities that are out there once you pick a program and start, and start uh, learning in that area as well. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and I noticed that Trevor has put in the, the chat here that there's a um, there's a career in CU, CU Info Week with career sessions um, coming up, um, and so that's a way to find out about um, what we have on in careers. Danielle, what what might an anthropology major um, end up doing? Uh, thanks. Yeah. So I uh, echo what Matt and Mark said in that all the social sciences give critical thinking skills, which I believe. RBC commissioned a study and said these are, you know, basically the only set of skills that a computer will never replace is the ability to look at something and see what's wrong with it, what is not predictable um, within that context. Maybe the cognitive scientist can correct me on that, but this is this sort of way of looking at a problem and taking it from a different angle than what is anticipated and seeing why that's important is, is the sort of irreplaceable human ability and, and social scientists are trained to do that. Um, I also, with these other come ones, less there, this going on. What's that? Was that a question or no? no. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, also, I will admit, in anthropology, um, the the method of ethnography yields a particular form of communication called the ethnography as well, which is usually a book. Um, that is written to convey, to tell the story of a regular human life in a compelling way. Um, and so anthropology students also gain that particular skill um, along the way, even if they don't write a book over the course of the career, but a sort of sense of how to write um, artfully and compassionately and with an interest of really conveying someone's experience to somebody else. And that skill comes in handy um, in a lot of situations, certainly in your personal life and like dealing with others in the workplace, um, but also in communicating in a variety of ways. Um, so you can sort of do the critical thinking and do the research and then you become an excellent communicator of that to people who you realize are different than the ones you're talking about. And so that translation ability, even if it's not translating from one language to another, 
is really valued in a variety of workplaces, certainly the government, where, you know, sometimes there's these really rigid boxes and people say, I don't fit into this. And the anthropologist can come in and say, or you, at least with your undergrad training, say, well, this isn't exactly how it works and communicate to both sides what's going on. Um, and then also anthropologists end up working in these professions that are sort of on the line between sort of business and creativity. So user experience stuff and program, you know, web design and things like that, that are really about understanding how people are going to react to things and what they sort of need and want um, that may be different than what is sort of being given and making those things line up a little better. Um, and yeah, and then of course, you know, maybe the more obvious things like all kinds of international relations and development type careers end up attracting and um, anthropologists who are sort of able to land in a situation that they've never been in before and figure out how to find their feet pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. And William, last but not least. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, so uh, in terms of what you can do with a sociology degree and what you learn, uh, similar to what Matt was, and everyone else was saying, uh, it, a lot of the skills that you have or you will have uh, when you come through our program are the kind of, uh, in, on the one hand, soft skills, uh, these kind of transferable skills, critical intellectual skills, abstract reasoning skills, uh, just an intellectual or cognitive capacity to be able to uh, deal with a lot of information uh, and uh, deal with a lot of sophisticated information in a, a fairly manageable way. Uh, in terms of our, our methods class, then especially in terms of social policy with government jobs, uh, a lot of our students, uh, and we've historically been a department that has fed into a lot of NGO and government jobs. Uh, so things like quantitative as well as qualitative research methods are in huge demand, uh, not just in the government, but elsewhere, uh, as well as all of those reading and writing skills as well. Uh, but we also have uh, numerous students going to work in the NGO sector, uh, as well as a whole range of different, uh, say, conflict resolution sector, which is a particularly growing field at the moment, uh, and uh, a whole range of organizations as well. So in terms of government, NGO, um, social media, as well as a, a kind of a growing field that a lot of our undergraduate students are getting involved in. Um, so with those kind of skills uh, and the students coming out of our department, then uh, we feel fairly confident or we're fairly happy that we can provide students with a broad range of applicable skills um, uh, as they go forward uh, following their undergraduate degree. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I think we we're going to stop for now. I think you've given you a taste sort of for the differences between the departments, obviously some similarities as well, uh, but we're going to open it up for questions. If, if anybody has a question they'd like to ask about any of the programs we've talked about, um, then please um, pop it into the chat and uh, we'll do our best to, to answer. Uh, what's the difference between psychology BA and BSC? All right, so very, very common question. Good question, thanks for asking. Uh, in psychology, the psych classes that you take, whether you're in the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Science are exactly the same. You take the same psych courses. What's different are the non-psych courses. So if you're taking the BSc, you're going to have additional courses in the physical sciences. So courses in, for example, biology and chemistry and math and stats, among others. Now, in terms of the size of BA and BSc, our largest program by far is the BA, but we do have a number of students who are in the BSc. Now, best advice that I can offer to anyone is that it doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference in terms of future career aspirations, unless that future career really involves the physical sciences. So we'll have a, a very small number, but there occasionally will be some students who are going off to medical school or something of that nature. And that, that might be BSc, but th those students are typically in other, in other areas in the faculty of sciences. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're really, really into the physical sciences if you're going to be selecting the, the BSc. But essentially same program, except for those uh, non-psych courses. Does that answer your question, Mackenzie? Sorry? Oh, uh, do you have any follow-up, Mackenzie, to that, or? Does that answer your question? Any other questions anybody has? Oh, yes, she says thanks. Okay, anything else that uh, you'd like to know? When do you typically choose your concentration and how easy it is to switch concentrations, which I think, again, is back to, to psychology in terms of uh, 
Uh, you can clarify, um, Malia, if it's not, but. Um, Sure, if it, if it is for, for psychology, a lot of our students, uh, you can actually select your concentration when you were applying to Carleton in the first place. That's something that you can designate. Uh, but an awful lot of students will end up uh, selecting after their first year. In reality, though, you can select right up until your, your fourth year, and some students will, will do that. We typically encourage students to select it relatively early because then it kind of maps out your program for you and it makes it a little bit easier to make sure that you have what are called the prerequisites for certain courses and a prereq is just a course that you have to take in order to get into another course for example right so uh so yeah you can really declare a concentration at any point uh, during your psychology program okay thanks matt so um cognitive psychology as well might be a little bit less flexible i suspect in terms of the courses that you need to take to progress through those streams yeah, so in cognitive science, everyone in the four-year degree, the honors degree, has to have a, a concentration. So it, it is something you have to pick in first year. Now, the, the good news is that in, in the, during your first year experience, most of those courses you take are the same regardless of which concentration you're in. There's a couple of small things that are different, uh, but you do have to pick one. But what that means is even in second year, it's quite easy to change. So suppose you started one and realize I really want to go another direction. Uh, it's quite easy to change in second year, but everyone has to start off with one uh, from the beginning. Um, but we have that flexibility built in. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, so um, Matt, can you talk a bit about social psychology and why it's so much better than all the other universities? All, you know, <laughs> other universities have good programs too, but um, Matt, what's, what's maybe unique about the social psych program at, at Carleton? Sure, sure. Well, so, so, social psychology is very much focused on our, on our relationships and how we influence people and how they ultimately come to influence us. One of the things I really like about Carleton social psychology the research, right? The research is top notch. Uh, so for just I'll give you one example of, of the research in that area, we have uh, Cheryl Hersinchuk who looks at relationships and specifically relational boredom. So she's really into studying, you know, what do you do if you've been with your partner for a little while and maybe things are getting a little bit on the stale side, what are you gonna do to spice things up? How important is that? How are the different ways where you can get that, that spark going again. That's just an example of one of the, one of the, uh, the uh, uh, areas uh, within social psychology in our department. I think that that is a, certainly a big, big strength. Uh, also, all of our social psychologists, they're also really good teachers, right? And I think that's something that is also useful to remember when you're, you're trying to think about where you're going to go and if university is right for you as well. Uh, the quality of teaching among really our entire department, but certainly also within our social psych area is exceptionally, exceptionally strong. Thanks, Matt. Um, anything else? Any last questions that people might have? Um, what's the difference between um, psychology BA and BA honors? Um, what's the difference between applying for psychology and applying for developmental psychology in the first year? Okay, uh, psychology BA is the, the general program that takes typically three and a bit years to, to complete. Uh, the honors program, that adds an extra year. And so for those who are interested in going off to graduate school, say for example, for an MA, a master's degree or a PhD, you need to take the honors, the honors program. There are also there are obviously some additional courses uh, and requirements along the way in terms of satisfying for BA honors. Uh, in terms of the difference between applying for psychology and applying for developmental psychology, Developmental psychology is a concentration possibility for psychology. So you might decide that you're applying for psychology and then at some point along the way, select developmental psychology as a concentration if you want, or right from high school, you can be applying to psychology, concentration and developmental psychology right off the bat. Yeah, so they're, they're both psychology, uh, but developmental psychology is a research area and concentration within our department. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and I'll just mention that, that the difference between the BA and BA honors, you can find across all uh, of these programs. So um, if you do essentially a three year program or a 15 credit program, that's um, considered um, a BA. We don't call it BA general anymore, Matt. It's just the BA. Uh, right. If you do that extra fourth year where you get to do a little bit more of those advanced courses, a little bit more of the kind of research idea, then that's an honors degree. Um, and okay, so a few more questions about social psych. The social psych program, same as any of the other streams in psychology, can be done in a, a three-year BA or a four-year. Um, and um, 
the co-op placement. Um, I'll, I can mention that a little bit and then you guys can jump in. There is a co-op program. There's an online course you have to take and they facilitate you finding um, a placement, but it's ultimately your responsibility. I think I'm correct in saying that to actually um, sort out where you're going to do your co-op placement. That's right, right, Matt? Is yes, that... yeah. And so what they do is they, they provide support in terms of trying to, to locate a, uh, a placement. They have a database that includes a whole bunch of options that you can you can apply for, uh, but a lot of students will actually generate their own co-op placement. They will propose that to Carleton. Carleton establishes the relationship and then you're off to the races. So two different ways of locating a placement, but you're not just simply left to your own devices. You're given a lot of support along the way uh, in order to, to find that, uh, that placement. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and can you just maybe um, touch on what careers um, somebody who's interested in social psych might be um, uh, where some of our students have gone. Sure, it's, it's a pretty wide range. In fact, uh, Anne and I were just talking with one of our former students in uh, social psychology just the other day, and he ended up going off to, to be a clinical psychologist. But it's a pretty wide range. I mean, we have individuals with backgrounds in social psych and cognitive psych and health psych who are across business and government and really a wide range of, of different occupations. It's not that social psych, people in social psych, that there's a sort of a linear kind of path that they take. It's, it's quite similar in terms of across the different areas of psychology. It can attract people with a pretty wide diversity of career interests. Okay, thanks Matt. Um, okay, so um, I think we're gonna wrap up now because it's a little after quarter after six. Um, and, oh. But there's another question, so we will take that. So I was trying to apply for the Human Rights and Social Justice Program, but it's not on the UAC website. Um, uh, so it would be under um, what we call interdisciplinary studies, so IIS. Um, it is its own grouping, but human rights and child studies are both in what we call interdisciplinary studies. So if you apply, that's what you should be looking for on the UAC site, I believe. Um, Trevor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be IIS that you're looking for. And within that would be either human rights or, or child studies. Okay. Um, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna close for now. Thank you so much all for coming and um, for um, giving us your your time for, um, you know, during a relatively busy time uh, of the year, I'm sure. So uh, I want to thank all our panelists. This has been great. I think, uh, I think we've all learned a little bit, right? And we don't get together and talk about each other's disciplines that much. So um, the recording will be available through um, the admissions website, and it will also be available on the FAS Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences website. And that should be up uh, within the next couple of days for sure. Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. We'll say good night for now. Um, good luck with the rest of um, the next few weeks before Christmas break and um, hope to see you all um, as, uh, as students at Carleton next year. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thank you.